Hello, I'm just going to go through question four from the GCC physics paper from May 2018. For question four, figure five shows a cyclist riding along a straight level road at a constant speed. Complete the sentences. As the cyclist rides along the road, the something energy store in the cyclist's body decreases. The speed of the cyclist is constant when the work done by the cyclist is something the work done against air resistance. So the first thing to consider is what you need to do and the focus here is all about energy and different types of energy. So given that the cyclist is riding along the road you need to think okay well what's giving him the energy to ride along the road? Well of course he's eaten some food hopefully. So in which case the first one is chemical energy and then the speed of the cyclist is constant when the work done by the cyclist is something. So as soon as you've got constant speed or constant velocity that means the forces are balanced or another way is of saying that is that the resultant force is zero and if you've got no resultant force that means that the forces are balanced or they're moving at a constant speed so therefore the work done must be the same if the object was accelerating or decelerating then one of the forces would have been bigger or smaller compared to the other one. For the next bit, figure six shows how the speed changes as the power output of the cyclist changes. So we've got a graph of speed and power, and it's a case now of thinking, what does the graph tell us? So you can look at the shape of the graph and realize that it's a curve. So that in itself is significant, it's not a straight line. So we can see here, that the speed is increasing a lot faster than it is just here. Both the speeds getting bigger, but the rate at which it's getting larger is greater when you have a smaller power output. So when you have a bigger power output, the speed still increases, but just by not as much. Now we've glanced at the graph, let's look at the question. So 4.2, write down the uh, equation that links power, time, and work done. So work done equals power times time. And if you do write work done like I have WD and then power as P and time as T, you do really need to then say work done equals work done, P equals power and T equals time. So if I were you, I'd get into the habit of just writing it out straight away. For 4.3, calculate the work done by the cyclist when his power output is 200 watts for 1,800 seconds. So I would always circle what we know, so I'd then write P equals 200, I'd write T equals 1800, and I'll double check that the units are in seconds, because if it's in minutes I'd need to convert, likewise hours, so I need it in seconds. So work done is those two multiplied together, and that then gives, in a calculator, 360,000 joules. If we just go back to question 4.2, I mean, by chance, I'd written it as work done equals power times time, and then later on, I needed to calculate the work done, so I didn't need to rearrange the equation. Sometimes people prefer to remember power as work done divided by time, in which case you would have needed to rearrange the equation, because power is how quickly you do work. So that's probably a more common way of remembering the equation. I just wrote that just by chance. So if you wanted a triangle, work done over time must equal power. For question 4.4, calculate the percentage increase in speed of the cyclist when the power output changes from 200 to 300. So we want to find the percentage increase in speed. So given that you've been given a graph to look at, at some point in the question, it's highly likely you'll need to look at a graph. So I've just copied the graph over and it's just below. So at 200 watts, it's a case of finding 200 watts. So using a ruler you find 200 watts, and then you need to go across to find what the speed is. And if we zoom in on that, you'll see it's 9.5. And then you need to find 300 watts, and you go up and then across, and if you zoom in, the speed is 11. So what you've got are two speeds, and you need to find the difference. So 11 minus 9.5 is then 1.5. Your task is to find the percentage increase in speed. So it started at 9.5 meters per second and it increased by 1.5 meters per second. 
So if you do 1.5 over 9.5 and then turn it into a percentage, so multiply by 100, that then gives you an answer of 15.8% increase. Question 4.5. The maximum speed this cyclist can travel on a level road is 40 metres per second. How does cycling uphill affect the maximum speed of this cyclist? Explain your answer. So if we think about our own experience on a bike, we know that when we're on a bike, hopefully a bit better than this one, then when it's on a horizontal plane, it's a lot easier than when you're going uphill. And that's because when you're going uphill, you're also doing work against the thing that's pulling us down to the ground, which is gravity. So it's a lot easier and you therefore need to use less energy if you like, just staying on a horizontal road because you're not having to go uphill at the same time. So how does cycling uphill affect the maximum speed of this cyclist? Well, if we assume that the, the power on, in the legs stays the same, they've got a maximum amount of force that they can use at any one time. And another way of saying that is there's the same power. So there's the same power output. They can only work so hard. Then linked to that, because this, it's harder to go uphill, you're going to move slower. So it's going to be a slower speed. And the reason for the slower speed is because some of the energy is going in to going against gravity. So additional work, you could say, additional work is used against gravity. The power of the cyclist stays the same. So by going uphill, you can imagine that it's going to be slower. And the reason to link it all together is you're doing work against gravity in addition. That brings us to the end of question four. If you have any questions, as ever, let me know.